Please mute yourselves. We'll be starting in 30 seconds. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. My name is Lorraine Justice and I am the director of the Student Sports Services Program here at Rappahannock Community College. And we welcome each of you and we thank you for being here um, so that we can honor Indigenous Peoples Day. So I am going to um, ask uh, one of our students, uh, Ms. Summer Chamberlain, to tell you a little bit of information about Indigenous Peoples Day. Summer, can you please unmute yourself? Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Today, October 11th, we celebrate and honor Indigenous Peoples Day, was formerly known as Columbus Day. As of 2021, the holiday is observed and honored by states, including Virginia. On Friday, October 8th, 2021, President Biden became the first ever president to issue a proclamation on Indigenous Peoples Day, writing, today we recognize Indigenous peoples' resilience and strength as well as the immeasurable positive impact that they have made on our every aspect of American society. We would encourage each of you to learn and support Native Americans by watching a documentary about Native American history, write to your local government, explore their art and history. How about this? Read the entire proclamation on Indigenous Peoples Day 2021 from the White House. Thank you. Thank you so much, Summer, for giving us some information about Indigenous Peoples Day. Now You're I'm going welcome. to turn it over to our president, Dr. Shannon Kennedy, who's going to introduce our special guest, Chief Ann Richardson. Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, Ms. Justice, and thank you all for being here and for um, participating in this course, we, we know, and, and Chief Ann will tell us some more about the rich Indian heritage in our, in our service region. So we're, we're happy to, to be presenting this. So Chief G. Ann Richardson is the first woman to be elected to lead the Rappahannock Indian tribe since 1705. She's a fourth generation chief in her family. Her academic background is in business and her employment history has been in business management and nonprofit administration. Chief Richardson graduated from RCC in 1982 with an Associates of Arts and Sciences degree in business. She was also an honor student. She had continued to pursue her education at VCU and majored in business administration. Chief Ann has one daughter and four grandchildren. Chief Ann was elected assistant chief to her father in 1980. She served as assistant chief for 19 years before she was elected chief in 1998. In 1989, Anne helped to organize the United Indians of Virginia, which was established as an intertribal organization represented by all tribal chiefs. The organization's mission is to facilitate greater intertribal communication, engage in joint projects, initiatives benefiting all the tribes, and formulate directives for the state commission to act upon. In 1985, Anne began an aggressive campaign to culturally, socially, and economically revitalize her community. This campaign included the development of the 6,000 square foot Rappahannock Cultural Center and the repurchasing of 200 acres of land for the tribe. In 1998, she launched a housing program and established a land trust for housing and future economic development. Chief Richardson went on to establish a subdivision for tribal members within the land trust, plans for several businesses and a 10 year comprehensive plan to guide community growth. She has served on numerous boards, including the Middle Peninsula Workforce Board, the Virginia Council on Indians, and the State Advisory Council for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Please join me in welcoming Chief 
Ann Richardson. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, as the college is my alma mater, I'm very proud to be brought back to speak to you today. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So, um, could everyone please mute yourselves, please? Thank you. Sorry about that, Chief Ann. That's all right. So as Lorraine had sent me a list of questions to address, uh, I'll begin with the first one, which is why, why is Indigenous Peoples Day important to acknowledge and celebrate? And as you heard um, the young lady, Summer, say earlier, that this was originally Columbus Day. Um, but as we're going back and looking in history at um, the wrongs that were done against people and correcting those histories, it has become Indigenous Peoples Day. And that is because Columbus discovered what he considered discovered. Uh, we say he was lost at sea and we discovered him, but um, of the Indigenous people of North and South America and how he eradicated them and enslaved them and took their lands. And so um, it has been turned around to be Indigenous Peoples Day, primarily because those tribes that he did that to have survived to today to tell the story of their survival. And so it shows their strength and tenacity in persevering and surviving in, in the face of genocidal, uh, both on paper as it was here in Virginia, as well as um, the physical killing of our people. So um, it's an important day for in the history of the world that social justice is being poured out for those people who have been obscured from the mainstream of America and prevented from participating in the American dream, um, both uh, visually, we were listened to, we were able to talk, but they didn't want anybody, anybody to hear what we had to say. And you could see them, you know, they would want us to come out and dress up in regalia and um, be seen, but not heard. Uh, so today, Native people are being seen and heard. And um, finally, we're getting the recognition that we so long have deserved. Uh, so it's important to recognize that we walk on uh, Native American history every day and we don't even recognize it. Uh, when the colonists first came to Jamestown, all of the United States was called Virginia from the East Coast to the West. And so um, the name that we had for Virginia was Seneca Maka. Um, and that was the Powhatan name for Virginia or our area. Um, and most people don't really even know those things. And we occupied yeah. all of Virginia. I'm sorry, Summer. Did you have a question? I think she accidentally did that. I'm sorry about that. Okay, that's all right. So we occupied all of Virginia. Uh, and our area and the Rappahannocks in particularly um, occupied the Northern Neck along with other tribes. Um, and so we occupied land just south of Fredericksburg all the way down to um, the bridge at Whitestone and over in Lancaster and King George County and, um, and the counties over there. So we were called in the record, in the historical record, we were called the Great Rappahannocks because we were the prominent tribe on the river. Um, and we um, took other tribes for whether it was through warfare or marriage or the fact that these tribes were being uh, ran out of their territory and we took them in and they became a part of our tribe. Um, until, of course, we were moved off the river around 1653, but our capital town was at Cat Point Creek. 
uh, which is over near where Minokin is today, if any of you know where that is. Um, and then we also had a king's town at Akbatal. So King Akbatal was um, the king over there, and um, he signed treaties with Colonel Moore Fantleroy in 1653 for the capital town. Um, and then there were other treaties behind that later on that we had with the local counties. As the colonial council became um, less prominent in the everyday affairs of the different uh, parishes at the time, it was called. And so uh, as counties began to be formed, these counties would come into treaties with the, with the tribes. And so we had treaties with what is old Rappahannock County um, and Lancaster County, and then they marched against us. And so, um, you know, the um, relations became difficult after the treaties were broken and land was being taken up. So it's important to know that history, to know that you walk on tribal lands every day um, and to honor that uh, as a part of the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The second is um, the tribal center opened and there is there a cost to visit? No, there's no cost to visit. Our tribal center is open Monday through Friday. Our staff is here. I do encourage you, however, to uh, make an appointment because I stay very busy. Uh, and I like to be the person who is giving the history, although I do have a historian on staff right now. Um, he is uh, our oral historian. He's recording a lot of the oral histories of the tribe and a number of different things. Um, Woody Walker, and he also is my um, environmental scientist. So he does a lot of work with uh, environmental uh, preservation and protection here. Uh, as well as the history. And you can't do one without the other, primarily. So he's here and he can be booked <laughs> from time to time. Um, right now he is working with uh, the Return to the River project that uh, we launched about four years ago. But we uh, just got out in the river this year. We bought canoes and kayaks and it's a Native American um, leadership, youth leadership program that teaches our children how to work in teams uh, by canoeing together and surviving together, uh, learning the history of these places that were towns that were occupied by our people and uh, learning the culture of the river that was traditional to our tribe that we have been about three generations off of the river by now. So, we knew how important it was to get those traditions taught to this generation so that those things could be carried on and that knowledge would not be lost. A number of years ago, maybe about four or five years ago, um, the National Park Service uh, came through to do what they called the uh, John Smith Historic Trails. And we got connected to them through um, their research on uh, Phones Cliffs, which were three historic towns that were occupied by the Rappahannocks when Smith came through in 1608. Um, and the towns were called Mangora and Wikupin and Machapit. And um, when he came through, we attacked him and that's how we got into the record. Um, and so they did a historic trail, water trail, and began to do work on the research of these towns. Um, these things had been lost to the tribe. We knew when we started the Indigenous Cultural Landscape Project, we knew there were various places that we frequented in my generation. I'll be, I was 65 last month. Yay! <laughs> and... Um, we had frequented places on this side of the river, but never really understood the importance of these places. And I remembered in uh, hearing the elders when I was a child say, if, you had, if we had one town on one side of the river, it was also on the other side of the river. So um, whereas the colonists 
when they came through to map the towns, they thought they were two different towns because of the way they thought about borders and containing land that they owned, which we didn't have any of that. We didn't understand borders. We didn't understand containing or owning land. Uh, how can you own what the creator has made? Um, and so it was just all there for us and others to partake of and give back to so that it can be protected and preserved. And we call that the law of reciprocity, which is a part of our integral tradition of the way that we think and the values that we have and taking care of not only our own people, but the surroundings around us, Mother Earth. And so um, when we, when they started to map these things, they found the location of these historic towns, just as our elders had said. And so uh, it started a whole project of archeology span with the University of Maryland. Um, Dr. Julie King is the archeologist there and her and her team have been down here in the last four years excavating these various towns and finding all kinds of amazing stuff. Uh, and then reaching out to people who had colonial land grants on these properties um, that had collected artifacts over the years and reaching out to them to analyze their artifacts and tell people what time period they were in, and what they were used for. And it just really opened the door uh, to the tribe to be able to um, recapture the, some of those things that had been lost and that, uh, that knowledge. So that's been really fun and getting to know the families that have lived on this land and, and felt really proud to live on the land and have really worked to protect it, um, which is really a, a miracle, you know, in the last 400 and some years that's been going on. And so that's, that's really, really, um, it's been really uplifting for the tribes to be able to reconnect with those people and to learn how much they love that land as we did. So. Uh, that has brought us to continue research on these places and um, continue to try to teach those things to our children so that that information and that tradition is not lost. Um, what does it mean to be federally recognized? Well, that's a uh, mouthful. <laughs> so um, if you could think about... Um, the state of Virginia as a state under the federal government. That's basically what, what the tribe is uh, under federal status. So we're basically a state of our own and we are required to stand up uh, a tribal government just like the state of Virginia where we look at environmental issues, archeological issues, infrastructure issues, uh, administration building, um, all of those different issues, courts, um, law enforcement, everything. And so that's what I've been working on for the last three years with my tribe. And we have a number of different departments that are set up that are addressing the various requirements that we are um, having to meet with the federal government. Uh, we have broadband that we were able to bring in, yay! We didn't have broadband for three years and we just went live in June of this year. So we we're just thrilled about that for our community and continuing to do more um, and working with the counties that are around us. Uh, we have four counties um, that are our service areas or our reservation as they call it. Um, it is King and Queen, Caroline, Essex and King William. And um, so we are now working with those counties in areas of um, being able to get money to help them as they plan for their infrastructure. We plan to take our money and further what they are able to do for the various communities um, to bring everybody on board because it's just so needed. Uh, same thing with emergency management. We have an emergency management department that is working with all four counties. Uh, emergency management, uh, looking at communication barriers uh, for emergency management, um, trying to get uh, cell signal in various places that they can't get it into. Uh, and so we really 
are kind of like the last mile people. Like we're working with the counties to help them improve what they're already doing for a larger group of people. Um, and then that's worked really well. I think the, the, the various counties around us really appreciate the uh, general additional support that they're getting to be able to do things that need to be done in the communities. And it's, it feels really good to be able to provide that for people. Um, what else can I say about federal recognition? It, it provides, um, one of the main things that it provides for us that's so important is all of the cultural support. So we get support to uh, work with our language. We get support to work on protecting our historical places and protecting uh, our natural resources and being able to teach and carry those things forward into the next generations. I think that's probably one of the most important things. Um, and to be able to work with our neighbors to make things better for everybody um, because we do operate by the law of reciprocity. Um, our county does, our counties do a lot for us and, um, and so we'd like to do what we can for them. We've just done a sovereignty conference um, because um, the relationship now with the tribes are different than they were before. So because we have this status, we don't have any kind of really um, relationship with the state. And so we began to work on uh, an accord, a tribal accord that really just lays out the protocols of uh, how the state works with us, uh, that we will work together um, for the good of all people, that we will, have integrity in the decisions that we make. Uh, uh, we, will, we will keep our promises and, um, and work for the betterment of the Commonwealth. So we just had our um, sovereignty conference and you can go on to, I think it's uh, sovereignnationsva.org and learn a little bit. I think in the next week or two, they're gonna have a video of the conference up after they've edited all the dead space out that you'll be able to go on and see. And that really, it ties um, the sovereignty that we have today back to those colonial treaties that we had. Um, and it's very, very educational. I'm, I'm hoping that the researchers that we hired to do the research on that is, I'm hoping they will put together a book that will be able to go out to various schools and colleges um, because people need to know this. and they. They don't know it. It's not taught in the schools. Are there any questions about federal recognition? Okay, we're going to have questions at the end. Um, what can people do to celebrate and honor our Native American brothers and sisters? Uh, I think the biggest thing that you can do is um, really just promote the knowledge of the fact that we exist uh, because we've been obscured for so long um, and, and enjoy the, the culture. There are many parts of our culture and our belief systems that we believe that we bring to uh, specifically this time in history when things seem to be upside down in the world and there's so much violence and division, um, we believe that the law of reciprocity will, if it's adopted, will take down a lot of the dividing lines between people because we, are, we all have to have a place that's healthy to live on. And I'll tell you, I'll quote my dad, you know, as the fourth generation chief in my family, um, he used to be just so upset when he would see um, business industries going up, just pouring pollution into water and um, things that they had fished for, they couldn't find anymore, those kinds of things. And he would say, humans are the only animals on the planet that poop where they eat, except for pigs. And that was a really profound statement 
when you think about it. Um, and we have done all of that, you know, uh, as a society. And I think now is much more um, recognition that we have done that because we're seeing climate change that's um, be being destructive of our lands and resources. And when we're going to fish for things or find things, like one of the projects that we're doing is to bring back um, the medicinals of our medicine man. And um, half of the plants we can't even find anymore. And it's really, really sad. People don't realize what they've lost until one day they go looking for it and it's not there. And so our goal is to make sure things are always there uh, for future generations. And I think as we become more aware of those things, they become more important to us. Uh, maybe we've come up a little higher in our thinking, um, but you know we have a, a, a spiritual philosophy that really speaks to this time in history. And it basically says that man will either go one of two ways. They will either take the path of selfishness and greed, or they will take the path of the creator and be able to um, give back to the land and protect the land as we were designed to do when he put us here. And so I'm, I'm hoping that's the path that we take. Um, I know lots of people are much more aware of their environment now. And the things that are out there that are natural that can heal our bodies without side effects of harmful chemicals in our bodies. And so we're hoping to be able to bring that forth in a healing center that teaches people about the medicinal qualities of these very important things and how we can use them to heal ourselves without having to run to the doctor every time we sniffle or whatever. Um, and I was thinking about, um, you know, when I was a young kid, how our elders at this time of year would start to cleanse their bodies. They would take these tonics that would cleanse their bodies and then put in what they call tonics and uh, elixirs um, because my grandmother had this apothecary at our farmhouse and she actually treated people that were native and non-native, people knew that she was a healer. Um, and so when you look at these things like um, dandelion, they would make dandelion wine and they would drink it in the fall of the year. And of course we now know that in all of these, um, Farm Fresh and different places, these super supermarkets, they're selling dandelions in the supermarket because they are a super green food. Um, and so we're seeing all of these things that she had in recipes that are superfoods for our bodies, antibiotic, antimicrobial, antifungal. I mean, it, everything that she did had these elements in it. And that's the reason that they kept as healthy as they did and lived as long as they did. And so we want to bring that to the masses. Um, we want to teach people a better way of taking care of themselves and taking care of their land without having um, to put harmful scientific chemicals on the land and on the people that ultimately will destroy us. So, that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to do. And I think if people can promote those things in their thinking and in their value systems, um, things will be better for everybody and not just me. Um, and then I do, do you have conferences and educational events? <laughs> yeah. Powwows that are open to the public. Yes, no, all of our powwows have been shut down due to COVID for a couple of years. This would have been uh, the week that we would normally do our powwow, um, but we everything has been shut down because of that. Um, and COVID has had a, a terrible impact on tribes that uh, live on reservations proper. Um, we don't live on reservations proper, we live in counties. And um, I know my friends out at the Navajo Nation have lost a tremendous amount of people because um, tribal social structures are 
um, where people are together all the time, families, large families will live in the same house and that kind of thing. And so it's been very, very difficult on them and not as bad on us, thank God. Um, because we're, although we're close in a community, we don't typically live together. Uh, everybody has their own house. And so it's been uh, better for us. I think we had one death in the community uh, during COVID, but that was a person who had a complication as well. And, uh, and then COVID took them out. Um, and then we had one other, or one or two other cases, but uh, it was prior to the um, uh, vaccines, and but they both survived it. And then Indian Health Services, which is a part of the medical program for the tribes, uh, came in with their vaccines and everybody got vac vaccinated. And so we haven't had any more issues with it. Are there questions? Is it time for questions? I'm so used to taking questions. Yes, Chief Ann. If anyone has any questions, raise your hand and I'll unmute you. It looks like Sarah, yes, Sarah Pope has a question. Pope. Yes. Okay. Unmute yourself, Ms. Pope. Okay. Chief Richardson, it's such an honor to meet you and have you here with us today. I had a couple of questions. Um, I've read an article about the preservation of your home place, the farmhouse you grew up in and your grandparents and great grandparents built. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, we had three chiefs grow up in that home. Um, and it was the place of my grandmother's apothecary. Uh, it was a working farm. I grew up there and um, my dad farmed and my granddad lived with us. Um, and my job was to gather the eggs every day and wash them and put them in crates. People came and bought eggs and butter and um, smoked meat and you name it. It was like a, a grocery store. <laughs> Uh, and so it had fallen into disrepair um, a number of years ago because we didn't own it. And um, my parent, my grandparents got married and they lived there and they rented until my grandfather died. And then we moved um, to my great grandfather's property. Um, and so it had fallen in disrepair. And, and in 98, we purchased the property. Um, and had always wanted to restore it because it had such a significance for the community. So my grandmother taught school there for our local children. Um, it was the doctor's office there with her apothecary. They had tribal council and government meetings there. And so it had such a significant place in our community. Uh, we decided to purchase it and try to restore it. And so we, first just purchased it and then tried to figure out what we wanted to do with it uh, when we restored it. And so um, in looking at all of the things that we were trying to recapture and not lose, one of those things were right. her um, medicinal recipes that she had typed out on this old royal typewriter that was left upstairs by her in her office. And um, we decided, okay, we can grow these things and we can teach this to people to make them well and they don't have to take all of these chemicals. And so we decided to turn that into a healing center, which, you know, in honor of her. And so we got um, funds to come in and do some temporary work. An architect is working on it, uh, Terry Ammons with Ammons Studio out of Petersburg. He does a lot of work with historic homes. He's actually gonna be doing some work with Minokin as well. And so um, now we're clearing out around the house and going to start some prep on the roof and just to stabilize it this year. Um, and we've also applied for a grant to restore some of it next year. So we'll be working on that until it gets completed. And when it gets completed, we plan to grow the medicinals there on the farm, mm. process them, 
for sale. And then we have two different people that one is an ethnobotanist um, from VCU, which was the original group that took her medicinals and analyzed them uh, for their medicinal qualities. Um, and then there is another lady who has a degree from um, John Hopkins University that in holistic medicine, and she's going to be coming down and teaching um, the medicinal properties of these various preparations, how to prepare them and how to use them and what to use them for. Um, people can take classes. Um, perhaps it'll be online, who knows? Um, but um, that's what we're hoping to do is to be able to teach people how to take care of themselves. Thank you so much, Chief Ann. We have uh, Ms. Kathy Payne, you're next. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Um, just a question regarding uh, tours at the Travel Center. Yes. You said that we could make appointments. Um, yes. I, I think I found rappahannocktribe.org. Is that where yes. we were able to do that? Okay. Yes. Is it a certain amount of people that need to go at the same time? I mean, with COVID? With COVID, uh, we're not having any more than about 10 people at a time uh, come in. Um, so if you want to like book one group one day and book another group another day, we could do that. Okay, thank you so much. And I just shared the link for everyone else. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. We have Carolyn Ashton, I believe. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Chief Ann, it's so nice to be with you today and to listen to your story. I'm a native Virginian and I live um, in King George County. And um, I have a question for you that's something that's kind of a concern of mine over time. I was uh, blessed to have a job several years ago where I worked with Native Americans from tribes all over the United States. And I have kept up mostly with my Blackfeet friends in Montana. And um, I've always had an affinity towards Native American beliefs and philosophy of life. And one of the things that, that I puzzle over is you mentioned um, how you all were asked to come in your regalia and you know present yourselves like some kind of scenario in front of tourists oh. uh, or gawkers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of my concerns always has been about appropriation and the and the appropriateness of white people, Europeans, um, uh, taking on um, the values of the Native American communi community. Uh, the, in the most appropriate ways, in the best ways, in the most loving and caring ways. And I'd just like to ask you to say a little bit about that. Because I mean, I feel like one of the things I know, I want to go out and visit my friends on the Blackfeet Reservation. And I'm so fascinated with so many of the things that they do with their lives. And one of the things I know is that I don't want to go out there and try to pretend to be one. Um, no, that's, that's different. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you could say something a little bit about that, I would appreciate it. So I see that you're on Catawoman. Are you on Catawoman land? Yes, ma'am. Excellent, excellent. Yes, ma'am. Um, so Catawoman was a town, if the rest of you don't know. Um, so yeah, there is a way to honor the Native American um, culture without uh, appropriating or um, inappropriately appropriating. Uh, tribal culture or trying to become a tribal person uh, when you're clearly not. Um, but the values of Native people, we believe, are the, the original values that was given to us by the creator. creator. And that was the way that he intended us to live upon the land. And those are the things that we want to share with people. Um, uh, we want people to understand that we're all one family, not just the human race, but there are all other be living beings uh, on the land that are part of our family, the water, the celestial, the land, as well as the animals. And um, so when we look at things in that way, we're not gonna go out and you know kill someone in our family or rape 
or take everything we can from someone in our family, we're not going to treat them that way. And so when we learn to treat things around us in the way that we would if it was just another family member, then we see things clearly and we begin to care for and have compassion for those other members of the family that are important to our survival as well as we're important to theirs. Um, so those are the values that I really want people to see, not putting on regalia and dancing at a powwow, you know, when you are not native, right. um, but to understand that these values allowed our people to live on the land for thousands and thousands of years before any Europeans ever came. I mean, we are the, the latest that we were occupied lands in the Northern Neck 11,000 years ago. So that's, that's like, um, you know, the wisdom of the ages that our people have um, captured and kept. And we believe that it is for the betterment of mankind um, and everything around us. So those are the things that we want you to learn. Uh, thank you for that, Carolyn. Uh, thank you for the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Richardson. Um, Dr. Kennedy, you're next. Thank you. Um, Chief Ann, how many members of the tribe do you have in this region? We have about 300 members um, in the four counties, uh, maybe 250, and then we have some that are spread out in other parts of the nation, like Hawaii. I just got communication from a cousin in Hawaii who just built uh, an outrigger canoe uh, called the Rappahannock, and it's on Oahu. So, <laughs> so we've got people in other places, but the majority of the community is uh, centered in those four counties. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Dinkle, you're next. Hi, Chief. Um, my Hi. question actually goes right along with Carolyn's. So I taught in North Carolina before coming here and I had a student who was part of the Lumbee tribe mm -hmm. in North Carolina. And um, she did a presentation for our course uh, about cultural appropriation. And one of the things that she talked about, so this was several years ago, um, and in fashion at the time, things like moccasins were very in Popular. vogue. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that she mentioned is that as a Native person, she would much rather you go to a Native American who was making these things and purchase from them versus, you know, going and buying at the shoe rack or, or whatever it is. So right. I was just wondering if there are any of your um, tribe members who create things or sell things, if there's anywhere that we can support uh, through that? Well, right now, um, my granddaughter is doing regalia classes here for uh, just for our own people at the moment. Uh, however, she is beading and she's getting all of the young people involved in beading and they're all getting excited about it. So I foresee a store down the um, down in the future of uh, things that they are making here. But we're basically just getting started in this again. I grew up knowing all this stuff because my mother and my aunts taught us, you know, how to make your own regalia, how to bead, how to do all of these things. Uh, but I haven't done them in a very long time. And as you might guess, trying to run a nation is a pretty busy job. And so you don't have time to do beading or things like that, leather crafting. And so um, they're, they're starting with these programs now. So I foresee that that'll be something down the road, um, maybe on the website that you can go to the store and buy some things. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next we have Sunny King. Hi, Sunny. Hello, it's so nice to meet you. <laughs> nice um, to meet you. <laughs> um, my question is, um, I'm descended from Native Americans in North Carolina um, on my mother's side, um, but a lot of like our history um, and how we are connected to them um, has been lost. And so my question is, is, is there like value in doing more research into that, even though I'm farther descended from those tribes? Um, 
is it like a good thing to do research and figure out who they were and where I came from and that type of thing? Well, I'll just tell you, we have this saying that um, if you don't know where you came from, you can't possibly know where you're going. So if it's important to you to know where you came from, then I would say yes, do the research. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Chief Ann, we have a couple of questions in the chat I'm gonna ask you. The first okay. one is from Dr. McKinley. Um, she wants to know, can you talk a little bit about efforts to preserve your language? Well, the efforts to preserve our language, um, we had um, Helen Roundtree back in the 70s visit in our communities, the early 70s. And she began to collect some words that were left. And then she started to research some words that um, were written in the record. But if you look at uh, the various na place names in Virginia, you will see Native American names everywhere. I mean, Tappahannock is Native American. Um, and then places, lots of places in the Northern Neck are. Um, so you could even just start with place names. Um, she and another gentleman, a scholar, uh, collected 500 words and they put it in a dictionary of Powhatan words. And then during the New World film in 2006, um, Malik hired um, a man by the name of Professor um, Blair Roods from UNC to create the script, the script that they would use for the New World film. And he, with some other linguists, came together and they enlarged that 500 uh, word dictionary that she had. Um, and I think there might have been some work that's been done since then, but we have not been involved in that. But the Patawomack tribe up in Stafford County um, has really taken on uh, a part of the language. And I think a class, the last I heard was being held at Mary Washington. So uh, we may end up sending kids up there to learn about the language. Thank you, Chief Ann. I have another question. Um, Ms. Crawley wanted to know, can you tell us where to find resources to learn more about the history of the Great Rappahannock Tribe and some recommended books? Well, um, there haven't been any books that have really been published, but if you go to the National Park mm -hmm. Service, uh, and it might be on our website, I'm not sure, but the National Park Service has done something called the Indigenous Cultural Landscape of the Rappahannock Tribe. And that is an, an amazing document. It tells, it maps out traditional territory and it names towns. And, and so it, it's a really comprehensive um, piece of the, just the landscape of the tribe and, and the territories that we occupied. Um, and then Dr. Ed Reagan has done something that you guys, he's done a dissertation uh, for trying to think Rochester University. Uh, he did his dissertation on the Rappahannocks and that's in that academic um, dissertation search that you can do. Um, so he, that's out there too, but not too much else has been really published or written about us. But those are two really good um, resources for you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ashley, you have another question? I do. Uh, when you were talking about the regalia classes, it reminded me that one of the things that I've been drooling over with my Blackfeet friends is the ribbon dresses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that led me to uh, an, another more serious question to you. You know that out there in the Northwest, especially, um, they have the missing and murdered women's. Oh program and issues that are going on there. Um, and it made me wonder, I mean, for anybody who may not know about this, it's that the tribal women are, are disappearing all the time and the law enforcement um, authorities and entities out there in that area, this is also in Canada, um, just don't 
seemed care about these women disappearing. And so the families get nowhere when they work with um, law enforcement. And so it made me wonder here in your tribal area um, with your Native American population here, what your relationship is with um, law enforcement authorities. I know that you have your own law enforcement authority in your reservation, but you do have to interact with those outside of the reservation. And do you feel like it's a just relationship or needs a lot of work? Well, I think it needs some work. I mean, we've always, you know, these local people, we know them. Yeah. Um, but I think the new status is uh, kind of an update. Like, um, and I know what you're talking about. A couple of years ago, we are um, members of a po political organization called United South and Eastern Tribes. And, and they do advocacy for the federally recognized tribes. And they had uh, the White House liaison down for us to have uh, a roundtable discussion with him. And I asked this question in the roundtable, what is this administration doing about the murdered and missing women in this country and children? Mm -hmm. And he looked at me very strange and he said, oh, we're doing a study. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm sorry, did I understand you to say you're doing a study? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I just want you to know that if this was any other ethnic group of people in the United States, it would be a national emergency that someone is abducting people, cutting out their organs and putting them on the black market around the world. And everybody at the table got really quiet. And it was like, I had said something I shouldn't have said to this White House guy. And I said, I will be monitoring to see what this administration is going to do about this. This is a national emergency. Well, he went back to Trump was in office then. He went back to Trump and he told him and about 30 or 60 days later, they made the announcement that they had put together this task force right. for the murdered and missing women. And then this past year, I think with uh, Secretary Hallen coming on in the Department of Interior, they uh, connected um, the emergency, uh, what do they call it? It's like where they connect the murdered and the missing people across the country. Right. They connected reservations to that, to that network so that they could post their people on that network. But that was the first time that it ever happened. And you're right, this is happening all over Canada and all over the Northwest. It's also happening down in the Southwest with the Navajo uh, on the borders. And it's a, it is a national emergency, but nobody ever hears about it because we don't exist uh, in the minds of most people. And we, because of the small numbers that we have in population, Politicians don't see it necessary to do anything about it. Um, so it's now just getting the attention that it should have gotten. And hopefully some of these governors, even for these states that um, have this going on are trying to now do something about it. Well, but, good, for uh, you, good for you for speaking up to the White House representative. I just read a piece yesterday on that commission that was established after you spoke up but it said it didn't really have very much in the way of teeth and that what Deb Haaland is doing now, what Secretary Haaland is doing now is going to be much more powerful and in-depth, thank God. Yeah. I'm so pleased to have her because she's oh, going so exciting. To, to take the things that we've worked on and really yeah. try to move them forward um, yeah. in a new way. And in talking about cultural appropriation, um, when you see, if you go to, um, the sovereignty site in a couple of weeks and look at the uh, PowerPoint presentations that um, were given there. Um, the gentleman from United South and Eastern Tribes gave a presentation on the Washington Redskins or the mascots that are Native American. And he talked about the reason that the Redskins name, where it came from and why it was so offensive. 
And it was because they literally, the uh, Calvary literally skinned native people when they caught them. And that was why it was the name Redskin came. So if you think about, um, you know, the Germans did the Jews that way and made um, lampshades with their skin and different things that are just uh, unheard of and horrible to even hear. Uh, it offends our senses so much now, but that was what was happening then. Um, and so that's why the Redskin name is so offensive to Native Americans. Yep. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, Chief Ann, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of the attendees, Red Pound Community College and our president and the campus leadership here for coming and sharing with us today. And I encourage y'all to keep in contact with the Rappahannock Tribe, Bull Center, I've been there many, many times. And Chief Ann has, oh my gosh, a wealth of knowledge. And every time I speak with her or hear her, I learn something new I didn't know. So I encourage y'all to keep up in contact with not only her tribe, the other native tribes in the area. And she did name some um, books and some authors and some written works that you can look at in websites. So definitely continue to educate yourself, not only today, for 365 days out of the year about the Native Americans who are in your community, okay? Thank you, uh, Lorraine. Thank you Thank so you, much. Dr. Kennedy. Thank you. Really thank you all so much. And okay, please come said They sent the question, hold on, Joelle, um, you sent the question, I didn't see it. Can you unmute yourself and answer? He's one of our students here. Joelle, hit unmute, X. Okay, Hello. So what, what, hi. Um, yes, Hello, I want to ask some questions. Because okay. <laughs> I had some questions due to, um, well, for one, I did do some research on you, Chief, and um, I noticed that your parents' last names were Nelsons. Mm -hmm. And I actually am related to Nelsons from Caroline County. So I, I, it was curious as to, like, are we in any time, in, in any way, shape, or form related in any way? <laughs> I'm sorry, I did not hear the rest of that. Oh, I was wondering if any way, if we may be related in some way. Oh, that's highly possible. You know, it's, to me, how could our people have been here and all of these other people come here and nobody's related to them? That just is not humanly possible if you know anything about sociology. So I think that, probably half of America has Indian blood in them, I'm thinking, but I don't know that to be sure because I'm not a scientist. But I think that if you are around people, you're gonna certainly be related to them at some point in time. And be honest with you, there weren't that many people running around in Virginia then that you could even uh, have relations with. So uh, I, I suspect you probably are um, at some point in time. Okay, that makes sense. And um, do, do you guys have any information on um, shamans or anything too? We didn't have shamans. Shamans were out in the, um, usually out in the West, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have shamans. We did have medicine men and women and they were very powerful spiritually um, and had a lot of spiritual knowledge uh, for healing and uh, a lot of different things. So, yeah, we do have some of that. Okay, because that's all I'm going to ask for right now because I am at work, uh, but I definitely will get in contact with you guys to definitely ask more questions. Okay, sure, sure. And if you want to bring a group, you know, be, be glad to have you. Just let us know when you want to come. Okay, thank you. All right. Fan, you're getting some shout outs from some local folks who are no longer in the area. Um, Miss Ashley Trevelyan wanted to say hello to you and the RCC family. She was one of our superstars here and she's now at Tidewater Community College. So okay. she sent a message in the chat, so. Excellent. Hi, Ashley. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay, again, thank y'all so much for coming and we appreciate you. And again, Chief Ann is definitely uh, willing to 
give you some more um, information about the Rappahannock tribes that are in King and Queen County, okay? All right, you guys, take care, stay safe. Um, take care, you stay safe. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Fam, you can hold on for a second. Oh, she leave? Did she go? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, let me end everybody.